Hello and welcome back to the National Solar Observatory for the second installment of our Eclipse Preparation webcast. Today we're going to be looking into the layers of the Sun. During the solar eclipse we can expect to see one layer really prominently and that's the solar corona or the crown which is the outer layer of the Sun's atmosphere. But the Sun is really complex and it has lots of different layers with very, very different characteristics. So one of the more interesting things about the Sun is it doesn't actually have a surface. Even though when we look at the Sun and it appears to be a nice ball in the sky, it looks like there is a surface to it. That's just the way the gases in the Sun are behaving. When you look at the surface of the Sun, which you shouldn't do without adequate eye protection, otherwise you might cause yourself some serious eye damage, it's a bit like looking through a, a cloud of fog. If you're, if you're driving towards a fog bank, it looks like you can't see anything through it. You know that if you, once you hit that edge of the fog, nothing much is going to happen to you other than your visibility will change. So the same is true of the sun, with the exception of the very high temperatures, of course. But if you were to somehow magically drive through the surface of the sun, you wouldn't hit a hard surface like the ground that we have here on Earth. It's just the gases change their characteristics. So the same way as when you look at a bank of fog and you can't see through it, you don't know what's behind it, we look at the sun and we can't see what's inside of it. However, scientists use some really interesting techniques called helioseismology to actually study inside the sun. Even though we can't see it, we can use sound waves to probe the inside of the sun and to understand what, what's happening in there. We're going to find out a little bit about that later on this afternoon when we have Dr. Frank Hill who's going to tell us about his helioseismology program. So the sun has many different layers, so we're going to start at the inside and work our way out today. The innermost layer of the sun, we call that the core. At 15 million degrees, the core of the sun is by far the hottest internal layer of the sun. It's also the most dense, and that means that it has the most number of particles packed together of any internal layer. It's about 15 million degrees in there, and it's powered by what we call nuclear fusion. This is where the sun's energy originates from. Taking two hydrogen atoms and pushing them together to, be, to form helium, this process of nuclear fusion results in a huge amount of excess energy. The energy equivalent of about 10 billion megatons of TNT is produced in the core of the sun every second. So once the energy is produced in the core, it has to go somewhere. The core of the sun is about a quarter of the solar radius. And once, the, once you get to the edge of the core of the sun, the next layer out is called the radiative zone. The radiative zone is a fairly thick layer above the core but below the surface of the sun. Once energy and particles of light leave the core of the sun, they have to travel through the radiative zone to get towards the surface. What's interesting though is it takes almost 100,000 years for a particle of energy or light to travel from the core to the surface. And the reason for this is as it passes through the radiative zone, it can only go a very, very short distance before it, the energy gets absorbed by another atom and then gets re-emitted in a different direction. So instead of traveling in a straight line from the core to the surface, it ends up doing what we call a random walk. That means that the light that we see coming off the surface of the sun today was produced in the core of the sun up to 100,000 years ago. So we're looking back in time. Once we get to the outer edge of the radiative zone, we meet a very unusual layer called the tachocline. And this is like a boundary layer between the radiative zone and the convective zone, which is the next layer out. The reason that the tachocline is important is that inside of the tachocline, so in the radiative zone and the core that we've already discussed, the sun behaves almost like a solid body. It rotates as a single entity. However, once we get beyond the tachocline and go into the, the convective zone and the surface, the sun starts to rotate more like a fluid. So where this fluid sun meets the solid body sun, we have a layer of very complex science called the tachocline. We also suspect that the tachocline might be the layer in which the sun's magnetic field is generated, but we'll get to that next month. As we mentioned, the layer above the tachocline is called the convective zone. And this is the region that brings us to the surface of the sun, or what we know as the surface. The convective zone behaves much like a pot of boiling oatmeal or soup. What we see are patterns called granules that show that 
material at the bottom layer of the convection zone, where it's hottest, are rising up to the surface of the sun, which is the top layer of the convection zone. And then we can see these cells, these granular cells, moving across and then the cool gas falls back down again to the bottom layer, where it's heated and then it rises back up. So this convection pattern is really what indicates that we've gotten to the surface of the sun. And we can see these granules on the surface. We see them as very as large bubble-like features with, with dark regions in between. So this top level of the convection zone that we've discovered is what we call the photosphere, literally the light sphere. And this is what we recognize as the surface of the sun as we know it. The reason that we recognize this as the photosphere or as the surface is that the internal layers are opaque but the external layers above the photosphere are transparent so we can see through them. So this is the layer where this transition happens. We found out earlier that the core of the sun is 15 million degrees, but this surface of the sun is only between five and 6,000 degrees, which comparatively is much, much cooler. In addition to the granules that we can see in the photosphere, this is also where we can see things like sunspots. If you've been fortunate enough to get your hands on some eclipse glasses, you can actually use these glasses to look at the sun safely, even if there isn't an eclipse happening. Just be careful to put your glasses on first before you start to look at the sun. If there are large enough sunspots, usually about the size of the earth by comparison, you might be able to see them with your naked eye. Once the light and energy particles get to the surface of the sun, they're then free to propagate into space. And these photons are what we receive at Earth and what we see is the sun shining in the sky. It takes about eight minutes for the light from the photosphere to leave the sun and to reach the Earth, which means that if something was to happen to the sun, we wouldn't know about it for eight whole minutes. It also means that we're looking back in time a little ways. The sun that we see in the sky is actually the sun of eight minutes ago. So now we get into the region of the sun that we're likely to see during the solar eclipse. We're going to see from the surface and outward. The lowest layer of the solar atmosphere closest to the surface is called the chromosphere or literally the sphere of color. During an eclipse, this can sometimes be a really interesting region. This is where we might see prominences off the edge of the sun, as you can see here. The chromosphere has significantly fewer atoms in it, which means that during normal conditions, it's almost invisible to us because it's dominated by the photosphere, which is far more dense. However, once we cover up the photosphere during a solar eclipse, the chromosphere can now really shine bright and we can see a lot more detail than we ever could while the photosphere was on show. One thing that's very unusual and that we still don't have a good explanation for is the fact that once we leave the photosphere and move out towards space, the temperature that we see in the sun is actually increasing. So it's getting hotter the further away from the sun that we get. And we start to notice this in the chromosphere, first of all. If you've had the benefit of looking at the sun through a H-alpha telescope or during the solar eclipse, once the photosphere is covered, you'll notice the chromosphere by its red material that's protruding from the edge of the sun. This sphere of colour can be very beautiful and really interesting during a solar eclipse. Once we leave the chromosphere, we again reach another boundary region called the transition region. Compared to the thickness of the other layers of the sun, the transition region is really, really thin. It's only 100 kilometres or so thick. But what's very strange is that in this really narrow region, the temperature and the density of the sun changes dramatically. So we go from about 10,000 degrees on the chromosphere side of the transition to a million degrees on the corona side of the transition. So this is a huge jump and we don't really understand the reasons for this jump, although it's definitely a question on a lot of scientists' minds. Above the transition region is what we really expect to see during the solar eclipse. This is the corona or the sun's crown. This is a spectacular region that's dominated by magnetic fields. And plasma is trapped on these magnetic fields, which gives it spectacular structure. The shape of the corona changes over periods of decades. So this, is, this period is called the solar cycle. The 2017 solar eclipse is going to be during solar minimum. So we expect this, the corona to look something like this during the 2017 solar eclipse. The corona is also where we see features such as coronal mass ejections begin to show. Although they originate close to the photosphere, the corona is really where we see them first because they're rapidly expanding. But we'll cover coronal mass ejections and solar flares in a later webcast. The outermost layer of the sun's atmosphere is called the heliosphere. And really this is stretching all the way out past Pluto. So we live in the bubble of the heliosphere. We live in the atmosphere of the sun. 
As always, if you would like to hear more from us, please feel free to get in touch. You can find us on Twitter at, at NatSolarObs. You can get us on Facebook at National Solar Observatory. And we now have an Instagram account at National Solar Observatory on Instagram.